title of this morning's sermon is Reap What You Sow. Reap What You Sow. I had an interesting conversation with someone. This was supposed to be last week's sermon. And God changed it about 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night on me. For this last Sunday, so it was a new sermon. And the person said that when they read that title, God spoke to them. And when they got here, they found out that the title wasn't being preached. They said, well, maybe God wasn't speaking to me. <laughs> so maybe God's speaking to you this morning. Amen. Let us stand and honor God the reading, the hearing, and the teaching of his word this morning. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 10. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those belonging to the family of believers. The Word of God for the people of God. Amen. 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 Back about 2005, a TV series was started, and the title of the TV series is My Name is Earl. How many of you guys have watched that show? I love the show. It's hilarious. Uh, what it was basically was this guy named Earl who, during the beginning of the movie, wins the lottery and about $100,000 with the lottery ticket. He's all ecstatic and he's thrilled. As he's going down the street to go cash in that lottery ticket, he gets hit by a car. And when he gets hit by the car, it throws him up in the air and the lottery ticket was in his hand at that point until he got thrown up in the air. And the lottery ticket gets caught by the wind and just blows away into infinity. And he never sees the money again. While he's recuperating in the hospital from the severe injuries that he occurred at the car and hit him, he begins to get spiritually, emotionally in tune with himself. And he begins to question why he lost that lottery ticket and got hit by that car. And he realized it's probably karma. Karma has a funny way to catch up to you. And he realizes that after all these years of the things that he did to the people in his past, his statement he makes is karma is a funny thing. And it will find you out sooner or later. So he decides, uh, the whole series, each week a new episode comes up where he decides, he writes a list of names and people and things that he did in the past that once he's released from the hospital, his intention is to go out and make it right. And so each episode that you watch is a different episode of a different individual that he's trying to reach out to or that he happens to cross paths with, that he did them something dirty, did them something wrong, or somewhere along the line he hurt that individual, or it was a girlfriend that he just used for her money, and then he dumped her after he got what he wanted, and he's trying to make his amends. And the entire series, the episode, was just that. It was quite hilarious. And as he amends himself to individuals, he'll scratch their name off that list. And as of course the series gets older, the list gets smaller. Karma has a funny way of finding you and I. You can call it what you want to call it. Many have different terms for it, definitions for it. Uh, some call it the yin and the yang. Uh, karma is what the Hindu calls, uh, it, it's called karma, what they use. There's excerpts from the Hinduism belief, and this is the excerpt of what they define karma to be. And it'll probably fit right in with your alignment. What you sow by your actions come back to you. If you make other happy uh, through your service, charity, and kind acts that you sow, happiness like a seed, it will give you fruits of happiness. If you make others unhappy through harsh words, insults, ill treatment, cruel acts, oppression, etc., what you sow like a seed will return to you. You sow unhappiness like a seed, and it will give you fruit of pain, suffering, misery, and happiness. This is the immutable law of karma. Pretty much what we think, amen, when we think about karma. But there goes on in the scripture 
Uh, and the scripture teaches us about sowing and reaping. And this month, in the month of January, I will be talking about uh, financially uh, setting yourself up for the entire year. I'll be talking about uh, time versus offerings versus gifts. And uh, I want to talk to you basically this morning about the principle of reaping what you sow. If you look at, back at Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 through 10, it specifically tells you whatever you sow is what you reap. Now, the funny thing about karma or reaping and sowing is that what you sow sometimes may not come back for a while. Oh, but I, I'm going to warn you. I've been a big old warning sign here at the at this exclamation warning. It will find you eventually. The thing about it about karma and reaping, what you sow, is that sometimes it's immediate and sometimes it's delayed gratification. Not on your part, because it's not gratification when you receive it. Amen? But it's delayed gratification to those that you reap. Uh, karma will find you out sooner or later if you don't make the mend that you need to and uh, repair the things that you do. In Galatians chapter 6, 7 through 10 says that when we begin to sow, we're reaping. It's like planting a seed in the other people. What you plant into somebody else is eventually going to come back and the harvest that you will reap down the road. So if you plant ugliness to people and you're rude to people and ugly to people, sooner or later you're going to end up finding yourself alone. Because people don't like people who are mean, ornery, and ugly and have nothing good to say about anybody. And they're constantly bashing them or being mean to them or negative. Uh, and, and your seed that you're sowing eventually will come back in a form of loneliness, destitute, or very little friends. Nobody wants to be around you. If you sow pain, sooner or later that pain will return to you. So no matter what you sow in your life to others, you will reap. And this is the same principle throughout Scripture. Reaping receives returning from whatever seed you've planted. Uh, Job chapter 4 verse 8 says, Those who sow trouble will reap trouble. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 18 says, He who sows righteousness reaps a sure reward. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 8 says, He who sows wickedness will reap trouble. 2 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 6 says, Remember this, Whoever sows fairly will also reap fairly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. And Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 27 says this, God said, according to your ways, I will do them to you also. That's harsh words from God. Can I get an amen? I'll say that again to you. Ezekiel chapter 7 verse 27, God said, according to your ways, I will do them to you also. So if you sow sparingly financially and you violate principles that are uh, biblical principles that God has got us and is teaching us. And I told you that this, this month I will be teaching on principles throughout the month of January so that you're able to set yourself up throughout the rest of the year. And my goal is to make sure that you're clear of these principles and all of the laws that we're taught that we're supposed to follow and obey. And last Sunday I preached on that saying that one of the principles that we need to follow come together as a church is that we need to pray for each other and we need to come together as a church and fast for the next 30 days. And that was for this Sunday, starting this Sunday. So tomorrow will be the first day of, of this uh, element in our lives as a church that we will begin to spend some time during the day praying for the entire church. I don't care where you go, I don't care what time of day you do this, I, I, but my, my request is that as a church, that we begin to follow the principles that God has called us to do. And look here, at the end of Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, it says, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Look at your neighbor saying, who are you? And look at them saying, I'm a believer, and I'm your neighbor. So especially to those who are the family of believers. So the first thing, and I say this, it's, this is this is hard for people to understand that, that have this mentality that the church should not worry about the church and go outside and take care of all the homeless and all those who are starving and all those who are, are having a hard time. Yes, we do need to take care of those. Yes, those are ministries that we are responsible and God holds us up to. But the reality is that a healthy church 
can't do anything if it's not healthy. Can I get an amen? A broke church can't minister to its community. A spiritually deprived church can't reach out and minister to its neighbors. If we're spiritually internally depriving ourselves from fellowship and prayer and fasting together as a body, and we're not building each other up, and the body's not taken care of, then the church cannot go out into communities and do what God has called us to do. I say this all the time. Uh, people, for some reason, feel that uh, the church is greedy, and that all the church wants is money, and, and that all they care about is money. And that may be maybe because of the distaste of TV evangelists that you see that have become multi-millionaires and billionaires, and they have all these mega churches, and they live in 30, 40,000 square foot homes, and they got 10 or 20 antique cars in their garage, and they got a $35,000 jet that they fly around, or a million dollar jet. They, and the reality is, we're not all like that. Can I get an amen? Most churches are struggling to make ends meet. Most churches are not prosperous at that extension. But yet, a church that is broke can't do ministry. So we have to understand that this scripture says that we need to especially take care of those who belong to the family of believers first because a church that's healthy can do a lot more. If you've got a car, you've got a vehicle, and you neglect the maintenance of that vehicle, but you depend on that vehicle to take you from point A to point B every day so that you can make a living, so you can make an income, and you neglect to maintain that vehicle, and you don't put any oil in that vehicle, and you just drive that thing, and you just drive that thing, and 40, 50,000 miles later, there's not a drop of motor oil in that car, and it breaks down and blows up the motor shop. Whose fault is that? It's your own. You've reaped what you sold. You neglect the vehicle, then the vehicle and that transports you and helps you achieve success outside of that vehicle is shut down because you neglected to maintain it. We are no different as a church. We have to maintain ourselves within the body of Christ. We need to be a body of believers that pray for each other instead of tearing each other down. We need to be a body of believers that fast together and come together on a yearly basis or whatever you want and fast together as a community of believers for God's will to be achieved and accomplished through the church. So this month, I began last Sunday, I said that I'll stay there this month. This month, I'd like you to join me in the Daniel's fast. Very easy. I'm not going to ask you to start yourself. The Daniel fast is very simple. You just give out one meal, or you just eat one meal, whichever you choose. I'll eat one meal a day, and then I'll be drinking a lot of fruit and vegetables and a lot of uh, liquid. So I'll be eating a lot of apples, a lot of bananas, a lot of grapes, and a lot of water. And I'll probably eat just one meal a day, and that's the Daniel fast. Or you can eat a few meals a day, smaller, and skip one of the best things you like completely. And just give it up. So if you like steak, give up steak for the next 30 days. If you like ice cream, give up ice cream for the next 30 days. If you're addicted to coffee, give up coffee for the next 30 days. I did that one day. Uh, one year I did that, I gave up coffee. And let me tell you what, the first three days was terrible. If I, was, I had the DTs. I, I, could not, I did not realize how addicted I had become to the caffeine. And then after the 30 days were finally over, and I went to drink a cup of coffee, guess what happened? It tasted terrible. So you get adjusted to those things. But you give up something, and when you give that up, you're sacrificing something for the flesh. Look what the scripture said, that those who sow to please their flesh, from the flesh you will reap destruction. So when we give up something physically from the flesh, which is uh, uh, something we eat or consume that we really like, we're sacrificing part of the flesh to come together as a body. You see, when we follow this principle and we obey this principle of reaping and sowing, it has a lot to do with just more of praying together. It has a lot to do with more than just fasting together. It has to do with how much we give to God and our tithes and our offerings and our gifts. And you have to understand that those are three separate entities. It is not one entity. It is not if I tithe, 10%, but I give to this campaign, then I'm not going to tithe anymore for that month. It doesn't work that way. And I'll explain to those in detail starting next Sunday, the three different areas as we start talking about tithing, your first fruits and your offering to God and your gifts to God. But this morning, we're going to off centrally co concentrate on this one issue. What you reap is what you sow. 
As we've entered 2020 and we have a new year, I want you to begin to think of the things that you've done in the past. I've done this over generations of, and over years, I mean. I've done this over the last 26 years of my ministry. I have pretty much exhausted my list, uh, and I try intentionally and I try habitually not to do anything stupid that will produce a bad seed to come back to me. And I, I am always sensitive. I, I occasionally I'll mess up. Uh, and Melody will remind me. That's one of the good things about my wife, Melody. She will remind me when I do mess up. Um, you're not supposed to be doing that or saying that. We've tracked that statement. You know that. And every once in a while, I'll watch a commercial. And I'll say, I hate that commercial. That's the stupidest commercial. And she'll say, hey, it's a strong one. And I'll look at her like, really? Seriously? And she's right. So I retract that. I can't stand that commercial. <laughs> it's such a dumb commercial. But every word that you spool out of your mouth, everything that you regurgitate, you can't take those words back. Can I get an amen? And that word has a result to it. And there is something that you'll reap from every statement, every action that you make throughout the day. So intentionally, as we begin to think about 2020, we want to remind ourselves that karma is a funny thing. And that karma has a way of finding us. And sooner or later, we will reap what we sow. Whether it's small or large, you will reap what you sow. So when you reap anything verbally or physically or monetarily, you will reap from every action that you have. So for every action, there is a reaction. And this is what I want you to understand this morning. Every aspect of your life, everything that you think Get that? Because a lot of times we think more than we say. And the Bible says, that, so as a man thinketh, so is he. So what you think will eventually will take over. The seeds in your mind will eventually take over and spool out of you. And sometimes you start saying things and you're like, where did that come from? But you're thinking it. So everything that we think, everything that we say, every action, every thought, Every word, everything, every aspect of our lives, everything that you do financially, monetarily, has a result that comes back to you. It's a seed. Whatever seed you put out, you'll reap a harvest from that seed. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're a Christian or you're not a Christian. I don't care if you believe this, this karma thing or not. There is a reality that the principle of this law is that it's called the beget law, and you'll begin what you get out. Doesn't matter what you put out, you'll get it back. And look, if you may sit there and say, well, you know, I've been pretty fortunate so far. Well, thank God, because sooner or later, it will come back to you. Some karma takes a long time to find its path back to your doorsteps. Some karma will happen back to you immediately. But what you sow is a seed. And so my hope for you this year is that as we begin 2020, that we begin to sow good seeds that we begin to make sure that when we take a seed and we plant that seed, that whatever that seed is, we know it's a positive seed. And that we take that seed and we put that seed into the hands of God and that we know that when we're talking to somebody, every word is a seed. And when you begin to think of something, every thought is a seed. And when you treat somebody in a certain form or a certain form, uh, format, how you treat that person is a seed. How you look at somebody is a seed. You know, we can look at people with disgust. You don't have to say a lot of words. All you got to do is look at that. <laughs> and you know that look is a look of disgust. So even a visual look is a seed. So however we end up planting and however we end up sowing, whatever we sow in 2020, it has to reflect that of God. And it said that whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will be eternal life is what you will need. It says, let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. See, this is the other problem. Is that there's multiple aspects of this text. If you sow it from the flesh to please your flesh, more than likely you're going to mess up. Amen? Many of TV evangelists have fallen 
over the years and the decades because they were too busy pleasing their flesh. I can name many of them to you, and I'm sure you can name plenty of them to me that you can recall right now that have fallen. They're massive, I mean, just huge from the big pedestal that they were on as a TV evangelist, and then they did something stupid, and they reaped their reward for it, and they destroyed their entire ministry. Some of them have even spent time in prison over it. But I can guarantee you that if we deal with the flesh, and we constantly are worried that when we sow something, how is that going to prosper me? How am I physically going to benefit from that? Does that please me physically? Am I always worried about the flesh? You'll reap from the flesh, and it says you will reap destruction. But whoever reaps through the Spirit, doing what God has called you to do, and you begin to sow seeds according to Christ, whatever you say this, you will eventually, at a proper time, will reap a harvest. And it tells us, do not give up. See, a lot of times, a lot of people give up because in the church, we don't see an immediate harvest. Or we don't see an immediate answer to our prayers. And we begin to pray, and we'll pray, and we'll pray, and we'll pray, and since we don't see an immediate manifestation of the anointing of God on our lives, and we don't see an immediate result, and, and sometimes it takes a while to get a good job or a brand new job that we've been praying about, and we haven't received that job yet. Because we haven't seen uh, the immediate results, we give up on God and say, well, you know what, it's just not meant to be. It's not meant to be. Look, I've said this before and I'll say it again, God answers every one of my prayers. I have not had a prayer to this day that God has not answered. It, is it always in the form that I want? Absolutely not. I've come to resolve with myself that the fact is that God will either answer to me and say yes, no, or it's not time yet. Be patient. And so I can tell you hundreds of prayers that I prayed and I would get an immediate yes, and I've had an immediate yes, and I can tell you hundreds of prayers that I prayed that God said no, and I wish to God he would come back to that table. Uh, but once he said no, I just dropped that prayer and I thought, move on. If it's not meant to be, it's not meant to be. And I can tell you hundreds of prayers that I'm still praying that God is saying, be patient. The time is not right. And I'm good with that. I'm content with that. Because I know my maker and I know my savior and I know that he's got the plans for me and there are plans to prosper you and I. And so this morning, as we begin to read and so, I want to remind you of an apostle in the Bible, the greatest example of this, Apostle Paul, who his example of reaping what he sold was delayed gratification. Here the Apostle Paul, Jewish Pharisee, with a letter in his pocket, in his hand, from the king, to go out and persecute the church, the believers, the followers of Christ. They weren't called Christians back then, they were called followers of Christ. And he would journey back and forth to and fro, looking for Christians, beat them and imprison them, taking everything away from them because they believed in Jesus Christ and wouldn't worship and bow before the king. Apostle Paul thought he was doing a great job for God. He was doing a fantastic job for the God of Israel. And he was saving the Jewish tradition, the Jewish faith. He was saving these heretics called Jesus believers and followers of Christ for the traditional church. So he had justified his actions and his persecution of the Christian followers. Years later, we know that Paul basically gets saved and God strikes him and gets saved and gives his life to Christ and becomes one of the greatest apostles of all times and starters of the church. And he goes throughout the world traveling many journeys preaching the gospel of Christ to others. And eventually, Tara comes back to the Bible. He too begins to be hunted, tormented, even in prison. Mistreated, and eventually killed for the very thing he was torturing and beaten and imprisoning other people for. His belief in Jesus Christ. Now that karma sounds pretty bad, don't it? But he died the same way he was treating other people. But 
but yet he was an apostle and a believer of all Christ. Dear brothers and sisters at this point, karma, reaping what you want to call it, according to God, you reap what you sow. You receive it. Don't be deceived by the old saying, what goes around comes around. You will reap what you sow. Whether good or bad, you will reap what you sow. I intentionally make it a habit to be very cautious of what I say. I, I was in, in, in conversation, and I, I used to be, when I was younger, before I got saved, I really didn't care who you were. I didn't care how I treated you or how I responded to you. If you didn't like me, that was fine. I didn't like you. But, uh, you know, that's how I was when I was younger. Then I got saved and I accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior. And I began this slow journey to become more like Christ. It wasn't an overnight transformation for me. It took time. But one of the first things that I learned in studying the Bible was this scripture. I also learned that God promises you that what you plant, you will receive. And so I have made an effort to do just this. I've learned over 26 years of ministry. It's not what you're doing wrong that's causing you lack. It's what you're not doing enough of the right things that's producing the lack. You see, it's not just Ten Commandments that we have to follow. It's all the other rules and principles in the Bible. How many did I say last week? Do y'all remember? How many? 603. 603 different biblical principles throughout the Bible that we're to follow. And if you don't know what those are, you're bound to mess up somewhere and forget them. And I've said this before when some young couple or someone comes to me and they say, we're having monetary or financial problems, we can't figure it out, and can you help us? The first thing I ask of that couple, do you tithe? Do you give 10% to the church? I already know the answer to that. Because pretty, pretty much 9 out of 10 times they'll say, no, we can't afford to. And I'll tell them, you can't afford not to. It is a principle of following God. God doesn't need your money. God doesn't want your money. God wants your obedience. And if it's a principle that God says that we're to obey, then you're lacking a portion of obedience to your maker. And every principle in the Bible is a form of obedience to your maker and the Savior. So this morning, as we come to a close, and we get ready to serve in communion, and prepare ourselves with our hearts for the table. Ask yourself this morning, where in my life do I need to change how I sow seeds? And what negative seed am I sowing presently that I need to just discard and get rid of? And change it with a positive seed. For every seed that you sow should be a positive seed.